a esto. Why are we here? We can ask this question. Why are we here? Why in the world, 9.30 a.m., you gather together, sit here, uh, do this? Why are we here? Why do we gather together? On Sundays and Fridays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and 6.30 a.m. and all night, Friday nights at times and all these things. With all the things that you have to do, you, you can go to any place. You have any choice. You'd rather be in some other place, maybe some of you, but why in the world do we gather together? Why are we here? What is this for? Some have intentionally forsaken other options in your lives. You could have gone somewhere, could have gotten more uh, money, one more zero in your uh, paycheck in terms of digits. You come here, forsaken all this. And some are here four years, five years, six years, seven years, eight, nine, ten years. Why in the world are we here? What is this about? Hmm? And we know that longer you are here, you believe in this ministry. And uh, those older guys uh, run the church, I think, in our church, CFC. That's what CFC is about. Ministering to one another, serving one another. And I believe in this ministry. I think many of you do too. God is working. And this church is about, uh, you know, changing people's lives, producing workers. That's what CFC is about. As much as we can, that's what we're trying to do. We will be judged in the sight of God. We will stand before God, and God will judge us. But what is this about? Why are we doing this? Well, in the uh, perspective of why we are doing this, we can have many reasons. We can uh, reiterate this in, in many ways, articulated in different ways, but... I uh, would like to suggest through this text two things, two functions of the Church of Jesus Christ. One is to protect, the other one is to produce. One is to protect, the other one is to produce. That's what we'll talk about. So first of all, Church of Jesus Christ ought to protect her people or its people from false teachings. From false teachings. So as we see in verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in the later time. So somehow Holy Spirit has spoken to Paul. What content? Clearly said in the later time, some will abandon faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Somehow, Spirit of God clearly spoke to Paul. We don't know if it is direct revelation or through the Old Testament, but somehow Spirit spoke to him. Does God speak to us subjectively still? Yes, God speaks to us subjectively still through the word or through different occasions, but never inerrant message, never inerrant message other than the scripture. We already have the inerrant message of God. God can speak to us differently, but nothing we receive, no message subjectively that we receive has the authority of the scripture. We have to know that. So whatever, whether it's you say, I got through this fuzzy, was it conviction or dream or circumstances or verse that I got? Never. That is authority above the scripture, objective standard of the Bible that we have. So always we need to check whatever we think we have received through the principles and overall guideline of the scripture. Now Paul received the message. What message did he receive? The sum of abandoned faith. That many, many of you may leave the church. Many of you may leave the relationship with God and fall away. And how true it is, even in our church, as much as we try, as best as we can, some have fallen. What is the cause of the deceiving spirit? There is unseen battle going on, and there's a spiritual realm, demons, and led by Satan. Am I making this up? No. Verse 1, Spirit clear says, Latter times will abandon faith and follow the deceiving spirits and the things taught by demons. Are demons teaching these things in the church? No. How does Satan deceive the church of Jesus Christ? Saints of God. Well, three things we'll learn. So, we need to realize that church needs to protect and we need to 
learn three things about how Satan works. One, one is the agent. Satan is the agent. Who's the agent? Look at this verse. Look, look at the correlation between one and two. It says, following deceiving spirits and things taught by the demons. How does demons teach? Does demon appear in a dream and teach? No. Verse two, such things come through. There's an agent. Means, instrument, through what? Hypocritical liars. Aha. Uh -huh. Whose conscience have been seared with a hot iron. They have agents. Demons, Satan, have agents. Satan is the head and demons are the followers. And followers of those demons are the people. There are some people. Now when we think like that, we think about some acrobatic people who can turn their heads 360 degrees like five times or six times. We think about those people. We think about some rock singers like people who has husky voice. Ah. No. Not necessarily they are possessed people. But it says their conscience have been seared with hot or iron. Satan often uses agents like Genesis chapter 3. Comes through serpent. <laughs> Pastor Young last week said that he uh, you know, uses some, a couple of the points probably you know, here and there that message I give and all these things, but I, I copy him too. I copy sound effects and, you know, gestures, you know. <laughs> serpent. Satan came through serpent. God uses agent too, like donkeys. And I'm not using euphemism. Literally in the Old Testament, you know, God uses donkeys. They're agents in the spiritual battle. And... Oftentimes, battle is through human beings, God and Satan, cosmic battle. Like when you look into Job, book of Job, Job is relating with people and they're Chaldeans and all these different people come and take away their positions. And it seems like it's an earthly battle, but we know that through chapter 1 and chapter 2 and a couple chapters in the beginning, there's a cosmic battle going on through what? Through people. So when David and Goliath fight, it's not just little guy beating the big guy. So that we will learn that little guys can do the big things too. Not only that, but it's a picture of a cosmic battle. David represents what? God. Israelites. Saints of God. And Goliath, the big guy, cuc big cucumber, and... <laughs> Vegetables. <laughs> he is the. He represents people whose lifestyle follows uh, to destroy God's kingdom. He's they're trying to destroy God's people, so that word of God may not spread. Name of fame of God will not spread. Book of Esther is a good example too. Now Mordecai and Esther represents God and His people. They were important people in the redemptive plan of God. Haman is a bad guy. Within his pride, he's, he wants everybody to bow, but Mordecai wouldn't bow. So why doesn't he just chop his head off? But he wants to kill all the Israelites. You see, there's a cosmic battle. Satan wants to destroy God's people. Uh, when we see that, we see this redemptive plan of God and Satan trying to destroy God's people. But sometimes it's not that cosmic either. Sometimes it's subtle. Like when Jesus wants to go to the cross, Peter comes. You know the passage. Peter comes and says, Jesus, don't go to the cross. Can you imagine Jesus following that instruction of Peter and say, okay, we wouldn't be sitting here. Okay? But Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan came through a close person, professed believer. Peter, one of the twelve. One of the three, the, the best one. Subtle times. Through close people, Satan may come to destroy our faith. Sometimes Satan can come and demons can use you and me, even as believers in Jesus Christ. Is it scriptural? Yes. Is it scary? Yes. How, how can we be used by Satan? You, you want to be used by Satan? Here, write it down. Okay. 
If you have worldly thoughts, like Peter, Peter had faith, Peter loved Jesus, okay? but he had double motives. <laughs> when he says, don't go to the cross, of course, he really cared for Jesus, but other motive there is what? He wants shelter. Jesus was his insurance, food. So worldly thought comes in, don't go to the cross, and when we follow those worldly thoughts and worldly desires, evil desires, Satan can use that, stimulate that. Worldly thoughts and evil desires, sinful behaviors, those things can always be used by Satan to hinder God's plan. There are agents in spiritual battle, and they're human beings. Could possibly be you and me in different times. Could possibly be your mom, your dad, your roommate. Don't go to them and you know, put the cross in front of their faces, but just make sure you're thinking, is this what God wants me to do? So agent, second thing about how Satan works is uh, we, can, we can learn how to test this. Test, how to test it. Two tests. Agent, test. How can we test this agent that comes? Secret agent of demons and Satan. Well, two tests, moral test and intellectual test. That's what this text is saying. Because what? First, Three and four talks about the content of these false teachers and what they're saying. These false teachers come, and they're what? They're forbidding you to marry and abstain you from certain foods. So listen to the content. Is it biblical? Listen to what they say. Intellectual test. But also another test is moral test. They are hypocritical liars. Who is saying what they're saying is important too. So what they're saying and who is saying, you've got to look at those things. Two tests. When somebody tells you something, you look at what you hear, what they say. Is it biblical? And you look at who is saying this? Is that person living according to the word of God? Is that person's moral life straight according to the scripture? Does that person's lifestyle characterize some things that they'll say is right before God? You look at their life, moral test. Always look at their life, proven faithfulness in their lives. You listen to what they say, you listen who is saying this. Now, what are, what are they saying? What are these false teachers who are hypocritical, liars, obviously, their lifestyle, who, who are in the church, they were the people in the church, teaching things in the church. They, what, what were some of the content of their teaching as we look into this text? This is really interesting. Verse 3 says, forbid, forbid, forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain food. Marriage and food. Hmm. When we look into the Old Testament, common uh, things used for idolatry, sexual relationship which represents marriage and food, always involved in idolatrous uh, worship, common sins even now, even though we may not worship, things related with sex, marriage, food, common sins now. Satan's method has not really changed. But of course, those external things are not the problem, but our hearts that love those things more than God, that are lured to do these things. Idolatrous heart, that's a problem. Always idolatry externally represents our idolatrous heart that loves other things more than God. We learned that. In history, there were people like that. There were people like shakers, a sect that had forbidden marriages. Obviously, they died pretty quickly in history. There are people of course, in a Catholic church, if you have a Catholic background, there are some priests, priests who are not supposed to, priests who are not supposed to marry, and until several decades ago, they were expected to abstain from eating meat on Fridays. The priests were not supposed to marry and not eat meat on Fridays. We were talking, I was talking to the pastors, and aren't you glad we're Protestants? <laughs> yeah, can you imagine not eating meat on Friday? Oh, man. I think about it, I go, man, what these false teachers were teaching these things, I go, there must be power in those teachings. Who would follow these teachings? Who would follow this religion? You can't get married? Wow, amazing. There must be incredible power in Satan too. I was thinking about that. It's pretty funny if you think about it. But some people were actually following. It's like that too. If you look at false religion, some of the doctrines, a lot of intellectuals follow these things. Why? 
I mean, it's, it is so illogical. There's so much discrepancy in what they're teaching, and even in their teachings, yet these amazing people, intellectuals, are following this. Why? Because there's power. We need to be concerned. Always intellectual test through the scripture and moral test through their life. That's how you test them. Asian test, third thing about false teaching. Protection is motive. So what is Satan's motive or demon's motive? Okay. What is demon trying to get at by luring these saints away? from the church of Jesus Christ and the teachings. Our thing is, uh, when you look into verse uh, three, so they for forbid people to marry and then abstain from certain foods God created to receive with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. So. Uh, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. How is the food and marriage consecrated God, uh, consecrated by the word of God and prayer? That's a good question. How are, how is, okay, I'm eating this food. How is this consecrated by the word of God and prayer? That's important. Because when God created everything, when God created everything, what happened? He already said, it is good. God said, God created, Pastor Young. And everything was created and he said, it is good. Okay? So he already declared whatever he created to be good. And then when he instituted marriage, Adam and Eve, he said, you know, they had relationship and all these things, beautiful. And go, it is very good. Okay. So, God already consecrated what he created with his word to be good. So when we eat these things that God has created, what we need to do is we need to consecrate it. Now, what is consecrated objectively must be consecrated subjectively. So we go, thank you, Lord. We eat, not too much, but we eat. Some of you have excuse and say, devour it. No misuse, no abuse. No misuse, like some of the things that are to be used for medicine cannot be used for entertainment or pleasure. Okay? Some of the things that are good, like eating and other things, cannot be an addiction. No misuse, no abuse. But it is good. It is declared good. It is declared very good. And it's objectively consecrated to the creation of God as he declared good, subjectively consecrated through prayer as we receive it with thanksgiving. But what happens when, we, when it's consecrated objectively, subjectively, as we receive it? We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And you, you are thankful in your life as you eat it. Give this day my daily bread. We depend on him. We have relationship with him. We love him. We get to have fellowship with him. We have feelings and we have desire to live for him as we get closer to him. So what is Satan after? He says, don't eat these things and don't get married. Satan is after our relationship with God. Satan is after that gratitude that I have in him as I go to him, as I need him every single day of my life. I go to him. I love him. When I get married, what happens? Marriage is the same thing. After, when you marry, you love your wife, you love your husband, have children, have a godly family. What is that supposed to be? What is the intention of marriage? Genesis 1 to 3 it says, he created it and said, let us picture our image, God said, and then let's create it male and female. Male's love for female and female's love for male pictures what God is like. It glorifies God and it shows what God is like in his relationship to his church and church's relationship with her, our Lord Jesus Christ. So... That's what Satan is after. No marriage, no food. Okay. Satan's tactic has not changed. He wants to hinder our relationship with God. He wants to hinder our love uh, with God, dependence on God, 
And that's exactly what he does in Genesis chapter 3. When he comes, he gives doubt to Eve. When Eve doubts, doubts the character of God because he said, you will not die. But then Satan says, then, but you will die. Exactly. Attacks the word of God. Uh, so Satan wants to, if the agent is hindered like that, what happens? God's redemptive plan is going to be hindered. Okay? So he wants to get at our heart. He wants to get at our relationship with him. Are we scared? Am I scared? Yes. Satan is pretty powerful. Will we win? Yes. Jesus already declared the gates of hell will not prevail. All God's people said. Amen. Spirit of God through his agents in this church is protecting his people. We need to get to the word of God. We need to pray that spirit of God will work through one another. You struggle, I pray for you. I struggle, you pray for me. You do pray for me, don't you? We protect one another. God uses us. That is a church of Jesus Christ. All God's people said. We ought to be committed to one another. We ought to care for one another. Do you care for somebody besides you? We might not know each other. <laughs> Too many people to get to know. But it's good to know. Get to know at least one or two people on Sundays and Fridays. They'll be good. Okay? Loving and inviting. But really praying for one another. Praying for smoke. Praying for the church. We need to protect one another. If you don't see some of, some of the people that you used to know, you used to see, that don't come anymore. It is difficult for everyone to know, but once you know, you need to pray for them. All God's people said, if you're gone, would there be someone else in this church that knows and will pray for you? Would that be nice? If I'm gone, would you pray for me? I fall away? Church of Jesus Christ were to protect one another. All God's people said, may we commit ourselves to one another. Second, function of the church is to produce. Produce. Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, as opposed to the false teachers who, with false teachings and false lifestyle, you must live out your faith, train yourself to be godly, prove your true teaching with genuine lifestyle. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Okay? And then Paul, so Paul is saying, you become a man of God training yourself to be godly so that you can produce these godly people with truth and the lifestyle that matches what they say. They are the ones who walk their talk and talk their walk. And their walk at times talk too loudly, even more loudly than their talk. People don't, may not hear what they're talking about. But their walk is so loud, they cannot help but to be attracted to the church of Jesus Christ. Timothy, produce in yourself a man of God and produce in your church men and women of God. Four things underneath this point. How can we produce in ourselves a man and woman of God and influence others so that in the church of Jesus Christ we'll be producing men and women of God. First, it's good teaching. Verse 6, so... If you point out these things to uh, point out to the brothers, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Brought up in the truth of the faith and the good teaching. That's good. Good stuff there. Good teaching that you have followed. Timothy have followed good teaching all his life. Then that's why he's here. We need to follow the good teaching. What's 
agents of good teaching did he receive? I think a few things. I think he had family. He has good mom and good grandma. He kind of had dad who was Greek, but wasn't probably, probably wasn't really around. Wasn't, really, wasn't even a Christian. He had family, he had church, he had a mentor. Family, church, mentor. You can receive good teaching through these things, through means of God's grace. Good teaching through family. Lois, Eunice, mom and grandma, godly women. Now, some of you cry and say, I don't have a godly family, so that's my excuse for my sinful behavior. Where do we see that in the Bible? That's what psychology says. But Bible says, okay, even though Timothy only had mother who was godly, not father, not both parents who were godly parents. Okay. Is it helpful to have a godly father too? Yes. But in the realm of the church of Jesus Christ, not absolutely necessary. What is needed in a parent is godliness, not two number parents. Godliness, because they were godly. Mom and grandmother, because she was godly, that godliness was transferred. Even if it may be single parent, godliness is what is absolutely necessary, not two sets of parents according to the scripture. So don't complain about your family because God can provide you through different means to transfer to you His godliness. Church, family, church. Acts chapter 16, verse 2, obviously had church experiences. God, if you don't have a family, God may provide you a good church to transfer godliness, train you to be godly. Oh, but <laughs> one thing undeniable about Timmy, Timid, timid Tim, uh, not tiny Tim, but Timid Tim, is mentor. Paul, Rabbi Paul, Pastor Paul. My, I was thinking about Paul. Tim, Timothy was following around Paul all his life and was trained. I was thinking about Paul and I was thinking, would I love to have him as my disciple and mentor? Immediately I said, oh yeah. And then of course I was happy and thinking about it. And then after a while, meditating on some of the verses in the scripture, I said, no way. <laughs> Look at, uh, uh, I thought, I, particularly I was thinking about uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 16 through 33. I worked harder, been in prison. That means if you're, if you're following your disciple, you got to be in there too. Been in prison frequently, not as a prison minister, you know, as a prisoner. Been flogged more severely. You, if you're beside them, you know, been exposed to death again and again. Oh, five times I received from Jews the 40 lashes minus one. I mean, you're, you sleep with Paul on the way, and one day maybe he took off his shirt and, Rabbi, what? <laughs> there was no skin left in his back. Three times I was beaten with rods on the move. Uh, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. At the time, stone was this rock coming to you. Boom. Its intent, intention was to kill, so he was stoned until he fell down, bleeding. Probably thought they, he was dead, but he didn't die. I spent a night and a day, one night, whole night and a day in the open sea, and you were there treading with him. I've been in constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger in the sea, in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled, and I've often gone without sleep. Is it painful to sit through this service? I've known hunger, have you fasted? Thirst, have gone, often gone without food. 
That was the lifestyle often. I've been cold and naked. Beside everything else, I face daily pressure of my concern for all my churches. You want to be his disciple? Go ahead. I'm not sure if I want to. I mean, can you imagine treading in the water night and a day? And then you're asking, Paul, so Rabbi, what am I supposed to learn now? It's been two hours already. <laughs> Can you imagine you're beaten, you're Silas or something like that, you're beaten, Acts 16, you're in prison. I mean, you're utterly beaten, beaten in a dungeon. <laughs> Rabbi, <laughs> can I quit? What am I supposed to learn now? Rabbi Paul goes, start to sing. Been broken, <laughs> been through the fire. <laughs> Felt the heat. You know, the lyrics. <laughs> I was thinking, there is no way. Be careful who you follow. Because you'll be like them. If I really love Jesus and have eternal perspective, I'll follow a man like that. But if I'm myself, as I am right now, there is no way I'll follow that guy. <sighs> when you choose a church, go to church with good teaching. In terms of eloquence and content, you may choose that. But you better look at the leaders of that church. Do they walk their talk? How do they live? Choose a church with rough hands. Leaders whose paths are narrow. And they have blood trails on their path. Because through their sweat, you learn how to serve. Through their mucus, you learn how to pray. Through their tears, you learn how to love. And through their blood, you learn Jesus. Good teaching doesn't mean eloquence of words, but that person. Because you don't just learn from his words, but you also learn from his scars. Good teaching is necessary. Words in life. You can tell how much I've been repenting through this week, thinking about that. Secondly, not only good teaching to produce workers, but training. Training. Verse 7, have nothing to do with godless myth and old wives' tales, but train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. Picture is correlation between physical training in athletics versus spiritual training. Verse 8 says, for physical training is some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Training. So not just one time in a revival meeting. Not just a few days in a retreat. But every day, every morning, you pray, you go, you cry out to God, you learn, you learn to apply, you learn to pray, you learn to sing. You don't learn to sing just in a worship service. You learn to sing in pain, in prison, in suffering, in hospital. You learn to sing. It takes training. Got to go to morning prayer. Got to have that quiet time. Training means you don't just feel like doing things every day. When you don't feel like you go, do it. Why? Because it takes training. You got to do that quiet time. You got to get to the scripture. 
and love him. Ask for that daily bread. You gotta love him. You gotta have encounter with him, heart to heart encounter. You gotta go to small group. You gotta love those people. You gotta rub shoulders. You gotta have some priority set, manage your time to go and to be fed by your small group and feed your small group. You gotta go to class and love your classmates and study hard. You gotta go to your work and work like you're working for the Lord. You gotta go through hard times. You're gonna have a hard time with your family. But it's there you learn to be like Christ when they're acting like agents of different spirit. Relationship problems that you have there, you gotta learn to apply because it takes training. In your sickness, you gotta learn to sing. In your marriage problems, you gotta learn to love. When your kids run wild in the future, you gotta be trained to be father to them, mother to them. In, in the midst of your death of your friends, you gotta train to be godly in the midst of that. In the midst of persecution, you can't deny Christ to love yourself. It takes training of little denials of now to deny yourself in death. When we talk about training, three things, grace, effort, time. Grace, effort, time. In order for us to be trained in godliness, it's not just my human effort, but grace of God. Grace. He has to give us power. He has to give us strength. If without his enablement, power, no matter what we are trained for, it is not godly. Grace of God comes. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, when Paul talks about grace, he goes, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He talks about his grace, but he says, I work harder than all of you. Pastor Victor, the quote of this week, of course, or last week is, what? Intensity of grace. It's the intensity of grace, not the sincerity of repentance. Now, he, that is just well put. But we can listen to that and we can misapply what he meant by saying, aha, it's the intensity of grace, so I don't have to do anything. I don't have to try hard to sincerely repent. If you take that, that's a misapplication of what, of what he was trying to say and what the scripture says. What it means is, it is the intensity of grace that comes, what? Through, through sincerity of repentance. We need to sincerely repent before God. And God uses this to give incredible grace. And when he gives grace, we can work, we can serve, we can do things for the glory of God. <laughs> but, you know, I get so pumped up when I go to TCBC for morning prayer. Of those people downstairs exercising that are of some value. <laughs> How much more? for the eternal values. And we need to train our bodies. We need to train our thoughts. So we train our bodies to, you know, get on, sit on your desk or go to morning prayer or, you know, come to Friday night. You sit, train your body, but you gotta train your thought to listen. You gotta train your, to, train your thought to pray, fight through your junk thoughts, idolatrous thoughts, addictive thoughts, other things, and pray to God. You gotta train your desire. Heart, oh Lord, help me to want your glory. You gotta train yourself in choosing choices, will. It takes training, people. It takes training. Some people say, How can you have a schedule like yourself? You know, it's been 10 years since I've been, uh, you know, Minister of CFC, and first three years I was so untrained in my schedule, it took me so much failures. Missed so many morning prayers. Okay. It took me three years to get to like schedule I have now. It took training. Training. Okay. Yesterday I was playing basketball. You know, I remember one of the weaknesses in the interview years ago I gave. I said one of my weakness is my left hand layup. I realize I'm pretty good now. 
a left hand layup. You know what? You know, yesterday I was going with left hand. There's five guys who were running over. They were jumping over top of my head and grabbing my legs and grabbing my arms. But you know, strong arm that I have, and then just made a left hand layup. It took training. You know how many layups I missed with left hand? Three digits. But it took training. I know how to do them now. I can make 50% of it. <laughs> training. Third, good teaching, training. And it, of course, takes time. Keep trying, keep going. Okay, keep trying, keep going. Okay. Until you can do that left line layup. And then the third thing, hope. Hope. What is all that training about? What is all these examples and good teachings and what you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you remember about? All that. So that, verse 9, for the hope. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That we have put our hope in the living God. All the training, you know what, all these habits, what we're trying to do, you know what these are for? So that you can have your own relationship with God. So you can go to the Lord and pray in hope, receiving the strength of God on your own. All these things is nothing. All these things are nothing. Unless you have your own hope, not somebody else's hope. You have a relationship with God. So because this hope is such a powerful thing in your life, such a meaningful thing, that when you go away two years later, when you're in utter hopelessness, circumstances says you should quit, there's a rising hope from your heart. And you go to the Lord on your knees just as you had done before. You go to the Lord. Pray. One more day, and He will come and save you. All the training so that you can have hope in God, faith in Him, trust in the living God. Proof of that in the hardships when you go through it, you won't quit, but you will pray. You will never quit because you have this lingering hope that you will go to Him. You know, there, you know, I meet all kinds of people. All kinds of people call me, whether they graduate or they're in different places in the States, they call me. There are like few people I can count in my, with my fingers, or fingers or toes, and all, you know, few people, 10, 20 people that I can name, that I would think, man, I mean, I'm an optimist, but I don't usually think like that. These guys are right about to fall away. <laughs> And they call and we talk and they keep what are you doing? You look at this, you preach it to me. Speak to them so that you can they can close get closer to the Lord. And then you know they're hopeful. They're, they want to pray, they want to try. But I'm thinking to myself, six months later they're gonna fall away. That's what I'm thinking, but you know, they don't quit. Couple it might be a couple years later, they write or call again and say, I'm struggling and you know, all these things. So it's just like what are you doing? You know? <laughs> They're flickering. They're flickering light. But they hang in there. If they don't, it, it doesn't go off. The light doesn't go off. You know, you know what I see when I look at that? I go, there must be God. There must be power. For their hope does not go away. I have my hope in my living God. And that God is my hope, not your strength, not your feeble muscles of your spiritual life. But I have my hope in the living God. That your faith, you will never fall away from your faith. You may fail, but your faith may not fail. Hope. Last but not least, serve. 
Good teaching, training, hope, serve. When you have hope in God, you cannot help but to serve. Right? Look at what Paul is saying to Timothy, verse 6. If you point out these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister. The word minister basically means waiter, <laughs> servant, someone who serves at a table. Our goal is to be servants. Our goal is not to be leaders. We can be leaders. That might be a position, but our function is we still serve the living God and his people through whatever title or non-titles that we have. We serve. We serve God. We serve people. Whether I'm a pastor, whether I'm a Bible study leader, whether I'm an older brother, older sister, whether I'm uh, setting up the chair, I'm serving. We're all serving the Lord. We are ministers, waiters for the glory of God at king's table. Is it easy? No. <laughs> Is it easy? Oh, no! Verse 10, and for this we labor and strive. Serving is not easy. Labor and strive. The word labor means wrestle, agonize. <laughs> agonize. Why do we have to agonize? So that we can serve. Fight against our own flesh and hearts and habits and will in this flesh so that we will be ministers of the king. Hope will produce a bunch of ministers of the king. Never our hope turned off. Flickering, but keep, keep going. For we have our hope in the living God. Let's pray. Two things as you pray. One, commit yourself to the Lord again. Lord, you have the word of eternal life. Where else can I go to? Where else can we go to, guys? We have the hope in our living God. Another thing, commit yourself to his people, especially those flickering ones, the faces that you have not seen. Might be your ex small group member to your family member. Commit yourself to them. Because we have responsibility to protect one another. Good minister, good friend, lays his or her life down for his or her friend. So we don't just learn through words, but we learn through the scars. Let's pray to the Lord. There will be the people with blood trails on our path, rough hands, sweat, mucus, tears, so that people will learn from the scars on our backs. Let's pray to the Lord. giving up on us. Thank you that you're compassionate and faithful, Lord. The mercy that you have shown 
Help us to show it in others. Help us to be your followers. Blood-filled trail and path. Help us to give our lives like you have done for us. And protect your people, the church of the living God, as we have our faith and hope in you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we rise? Saying, those storm of strife assail me without warning, and it'll come, but we have our hope in our living God. Yeah. 
asking you to pray just a little bit more. Pray for yourself and pray for those faces that pops into your mind.